to get a chance to share this idea about utopian design fiction, so both a concept and a process, um, I'm really gonna like kind of go out there a little bit. So I appreciate your support as I expand upon this craft or this practice that I do, but kind of in a new way. Um, before I get there, um, I want to share a little bit um, to make the most of my journey here. I did do a little road trip before coming to UX New Zealand. I did maybe the very stereotypical kind of tourist thing and rented like a, a garishly branded camper van <laughs> and spent a week touring around the South Island. And it's really been a stunning space for me to really reflect on utopian design fictions and really relate to this craft and this practice in a new way. Um, and it was a very wet trip, um, but this was okay because um, while I was out here in my rain pants for a week, basically, um, California, which is um, one of the places in the world that uh, I, I love and I, I call home, basically caught on fire. So um, a combination of really dry conditions and hurricane to force winds, which are um, really unusual, um, made the conditions for uh, wildfires not just like out in the countryside, but actually in cities, so like inside the city of Los Angeles. This means evacuations for hundreds of thousands of people, uh, deliberate power outages for as many as three million people at a time, and dangerous air pollution levels for everybody. So um, really waking up to scenes like this was like a breath of relief. It's just like, this is very soothing to me. This is a, a utopian design reality here. You know. um, but one of my favorite things I did on my trip was this three hour walk. And really it was like a time travel um, through the glacial valley, uh, 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 glacial valley in the Southern Alps. Where, um, from reading the signs, I learned that this glacier uh, 18,000 years ago went all the way to the coast. But I started at this first hash mark here um, where the sign told me it was known that the glacier had been 14,000 years ago. And it took about 1,000 years to walk. No, it took <laughs> one hour to get to a point where it was known that the glacier had advanced and retreated um, and was last seen at that point 1,000 years ago. And then it took another uh, hour um, to get to a point where it was known that the glacier had advanced and retreated to a place where it was last seen 100 years ago. And then in the last hour that I walked, um, I got to a point where it was known that the glacier had been last 10 years ago. And during this time period, the glacier had not really been advancing and retreating the way it had in the previous sections. It really has it's just been retreating. Um, and I didn't go past this point because basically for this three hour walk, I was practically by myself. And um, the signs started to say that there were gonna be falling rocks and it was gonna be really dangerous. <laughs> and um, without a soul around me, I was like, well, maybe I should stop here. <laughs> but I could see around the corner and that last mark is um, where the glacier more or less was this past Monday. So you can see the satellite image is out of date. Um, this is really like uh, retreating quite quickly. I mean, I think we've all seen stats and graphs of like climate change and what's happening in terms of carbon emissions and impacts, but really to actually physically walk this pathway and really feel time compressing or time accelerating. Um, and as much as this is really grim in a lot of ways, I actually wanna make an argument that now is a time for clear-eyed optimism and that we as designers are critically positioned in what's really a critical time um, to actually be a part of stabilizing both the natural and built systems. So there's three kind of uh, sets of voices that I'm starting to really hear um, that are telling me that we have this you know, really important window of opportunity. And the first set of voices is really coming from the business community. So just this past August, the business, or the business Roundtable, which is a get-together of 180-plus uh, business leaders in the US, including many of the largest corporations in the world, have actually expanded the definition of what a corporation is beyond just being obliged to uh, um, returning shareholder value. 
um, but to actually also be responsible and be held responsible to B Corp sort of things that um, like employees and customers and the environment. So to be determined like what this actually really means, but just even hearing this kind of messaging coming from fiscally conservative um, viewpoints is really interesting to me. Um, the second set of voices that's actually coming from within our own industry. This is an illustration from a San Francisco-based artist, Chloe Lang, um, who did some really nice work for the Center for Humane Technology, um, which is in Silicon Valley. Um, and they are starting to really get the attention even of the US Congress at this point. Um, and co the US Congress is considering banning, actually, uh, things that can be identified as dark patterns, infinite scroll, manipulative CTAs, and um, things like opt-out sharing. Um, and in Barcelona, which is the second place that I call home um, and where I maintain my teaching practice, technology addiction is beginning to be um, cared for in, in uh, addiction recovery centers alongside drug and alcohol and gambling addictions. And I think it's worth mentioning um, that near I all, not always confident saying his name, who's the author of the book Hooked, which has been, you know, many of us probably have read this book, is, um, has been in our industry a Bible of kind of this habit-forming tech design, is now offering advice in um, how to not be distracted. So his second book called Indistractable is um, not really taking everything back, but it, but it is um, significant repositioning. And I'm hearing many voices within our industry from many people, even within this room, that some conversations we've had um, of kind of waking up to our cracks in our own system where we're leaving behind a trail of suffering um, and externalities or unintended costly consequences on the people that we're meaning to serve. So change is coming, it might be, or I expect it to be, very awkward and full of volatility, but I do see it as a window of opportunity to really right some wrongs. Um, and this is gonna become even more important, it's more critical as we work with new inputs like gestures and emotional cues, like voice and hormones and heartbeats and facial expressions. And then the third set of voices that I'm really starting to hear are helping me make a connection between some of these macro challenges that we're all contending with in this world and the micro stuff that's actually within our industry. And this is a quote from Jonathan Franzen in a somewhat controversial piece that was in The New Yorker this past September. I've got a, long, a longer excerpt of the quote on the back of the handbook for you, but this is like the gist of it that um, you know, I keep going back to and thinking. And his piece was really controversial because it was um, aiming at this idea of hope beyond hope. So not hope um, for the climate crisis in terms of policy regulation or recycling, but what hope means when um, we're talking about having a livable life in a warming planet. And for me, the piece really articulated um, or it's helping me articulate, and we can keep talking about this, how we don't all need to like up and abandon our jobs in UX to currently to do like UX and solar or water efficiency or firefighting, but that would be really cool. Um, but that it's really important for many of us to stay in the roles that we have because um, by taking on things like trolls and dark patterns and manipulative copy and externalities, we actually have a chance to build back strength and resiliency and health in every built system. So it's not just the climate crisis. We know it's other things like plastic and migration and automation, all these sort of challenges that are coming at some sort of convergence right now. Um, but this is the world that we get because of a lot of decisions that we've been a part of making in many ways. Um, but we are, in design, really critically positioned at what is a very critical, critical moment to really retrofit human and cultural resiliency. And it's these three voices that are making me feel like now is really the time. And this is where utopian design fictions really has a, uh, has a process to offer us. Um, 
uh, where design can really be ready to, for like a good, healthy, clear-eyed, but decidedly optimistic um, visioning process. A sort of optimism lever of, of sorts um, that I have great faith in uh, to be able to help us sort of catapult us and future generations into a happy and healthy and a balanced and abundant future. Um, so my path into UX research got um, started in trends research, where the stuff of design fictions and speculative fictions and scenario planning are really the norm. Um, so this is something I bring to our practice. Um, but design fictions are fact-based fictions envisioning future conditions to inform and orient ourselves to up to what the future might look like so we kind of better know what we might want to do. Um, and the stories that are told in these fictions can really range from dystopian on one side to kind of this sort of false neutral in the middle to something more utopian, which is what I want us to be working on today. Um, and the dystopian stuff and the neutral stuff is really rampant in our culture. Like, these are the things we hear within the organizations we work for. These are the stories we hear, um, you know, in the literature or uh, when we go to the movies. Um, but without taking the time to construct uh, these utopian fictions, our designs are really at risk of being limited by the common cultural reference points that we do have. Or increasingly this sort of um, purpose paralysis or existential dread that the micro things we do in UX aren't really doing anything to help people contend with the macro challenges of our time. And this, this really limits the potential of our work. So before Black Mirror, I'm sure you guys have all seen this kind of stuff a million times, but Minority Report was the most talked about example about how um, dystopian fictions can inform product design. And the internet's full of sites and blogs where you can um, like just Google sci-fi interfaces and you'll see you know, this sort of pattern. That where any kind of technological change that has you know, been built into a story that uh, you know, comics or Hollywood or books have ever told, um, be it devices or AI or virtual dimensions, you name it, a lot of these um, new and emerging ideas are being depicted in worlds that are dark, um, sun doesn't shine, uh, there's sinister robots and killer alien cops, um, and poor people get left behind in kind of a scorched earth scenario, while the wealthy people get to go to lovely places that look a lot like New Zealand, but, um, <laughs> but are in like near space. Um, and stories like this sell tickets, and they sell subscriptions, and they keep people on the edge of their seat, um, whether they're in the theater or they're at home. But it's really not designed, it's not great stuff to inform UX, um, where you know, our role is to build functional products that are usable and comfortable, and with experiences that ascend towards the meaningful and delightful. Um, and if we don't do something like ut utopian design fictions, um, it doesn't have to be utopian design fictions, but a process that kind of reaches in that direction, uh, our designs are really, um, all the stuff is going to seep into our designs. So be it UI or the color palette or the messaging, um, you can see the pattern really, you know, from, from left to right here. Um, contrastingly, utopian design fictions ask us to, to really stake a claim in our preferred futures. Um, I didn't make this up, I sketched it out, but I did, this is not my model. You can look up uh, preferred futures and I've got um, some books and references on the back of the handbook for you. Um, but it's a conceptual model that helps us envision the possible. Um, around like if we imagine all things that might happen from this moment moving forward as different bands that uh, you know decrease by different levels of, of certainty um, and then what it is amongst the preferred that kind of lies within all these sorts of possibilities and history is full of examples um, of uh, how this kind of thinking has led to design that has horrific outcomes and the term futurist itself has roots in fascism. But in a world where tools and methods can be used for good or bad, I'm sharing this with you because I'm counting on you just to use it for good, yeah? 
Um, but four things to know when constructing utopian design fictions. Um, the first being, uh, it is research-based. So it's not fantasy. Um, it is fiction, but it's based in facts. So uh, as a design researcher, um, I've got all, I have a recommendation for specific types of research methods that are great to feed into this process. But it's really a pattern of you know, primary and secondary research, and then finding the patterns that emerge from that, and then telling these stories um, from a future point of view where the preferred future is already worked out. And then the second thing to know about constructing utopian design fictions is they're really mashups of the, the familiar with the new. So whether it comes in the form of something written or a storyboard or a collage or a video, um, it's about this sort of layering here that you know, I've done very crudely <laughs> in Illustrator. Um, and I could show you more sophisticated work from students that are actually really talented visual designers. But the point is really, it doesn't have to take a whole lot of time. And so you want to use the skills that you have or the skills that are on your team or maybe even get your stakeholders or clients involved um, and use a storytelling method that, that makes impact. So mashing up you know, this, this familiar world, this is an actual street in Barcelona with these new ideas that are being explored here. And then the third thing to know about uh, constructing utopian design fictions is they really should address positive mental and social health. Um, again, this, this drawing is very simple, but I hope the emotion behind it comes, comes through, is crystal clear, that when something like a well-thought-out, carbon-neutral flying car taxi share system um, helps relieve on-the-ground traffic congestion, um, my commute home from Mountain View is a pure joy here. Um, so things like gestures, colors, um, using lighting, like always you know, leveraging the sunset hour so that possibilities are emerged and are envisioned within a scene that's like the dawn of uh, first light or the, the perfect sunset. And then the fourth thing to know about constructing utopian design fictions is um, it's really important to imagine or to be able to envision what it's like to live fine and even fashionably um, in a stabilized and thriving ecology. Um, for every natural and built system to be as strong and healthy as we can make it, we need to be able to see that that's possible first and really um, believe in that. So this is a simple mock-up of a fashion forward rain gear for a wetter world made, for re made from reclaimed waterproof materials with a responsive, inflatable, transparent hood and ankle boots to match. And it's shown here in a you know, lovely wooded environment and a familiar streetscape um, that is, is not scary. This is like part of uh, you know, an everyday and but also thriving environment. Contrastingly, you know, Blade Runner had a really great uh, raincoat too. Um, but it was like always raining, and I think it was acid rain, and these are pretty shitty surroundings, and everything's broken, you're like always on the run. You know, this is like not a utopian design fiction. Cool coat, but you know, not what we're going for. So, for any of us, if we get a chance to design things, you know, something related to entertainment or something with um, kind of a virtual dimension, the point is that we're not accidentally influenced by stories like WALL-E, where the you know, surviving human populations all obese and without agency and dopefully sort of like coexisting but never touching one another but are decidedly influenced by team's vision to like bolster social bonding. So simple photographs like this in a real family environment are really easy to shoot. Um, this is my niece and nephew, who you'll see later on in the presentation, my sister-in-law. Um, but they're an easy way to share um, kind of an idea of new technologies in, in an environment that helps teams envision uh, things in like a family setting. So people are together, um, there's messes, 
There's a range of emotions. We see some nurturing and intergenerational exchanges. Or in an illustration like this, um, this type of technology is envisioned in a way that gets community members of all ages involved and contribute to social good. So here we have um, some elders engaged. Um, they're earned experts in their fields that are guiding safety and security challenges of today. And the users are not alone, but are shown together, um, envisioned as part of like dynamic social activities that are out in the world and well-dressed, you know, in Chanel, um, <laughs> that can be layered into, you know, everyday streetscapes, like this one is outside my current office building. Um, and then you just take that same layer and imagine it, um, you know, now this pair is our ambassadors of new ways of learning and fostering curiosity in city schools. Or maybe some kind of new travel futures where something like a half or a third of future trips have some sort of virtual dimension that can help neighborhoods recover from um, over-tourism, uh, like the super crammed uh, Rambles in Barcelona. Or if any of us get a chance to um, work on design for near space travel or maybe space living, um, we take the time to envision resolution of the critical issues of today. So border issues about separating families and caging children and restricting freedom of movement. Um, and you know, with these things in mind, asking, what does a passport stamp look like in a future defined by safety and inclusion and warm welcomes? Um, what's the border experience? And what are the uniforms of the friendly interstellar border control agents? Or when whiteboarding and wireframing today's more common design tasks, we really lean um, our utopian design fiction practices on uh, future outcomes informed by frameworks such as the Human Design Guide, from, again from the Center for Humane Technology, or some of the frameworks that we've um, heard about earlier um, in earlier talks. I've got two examples. They're listed on the back really quick. Um, a really great book and then a really great video. Both great examples of what it's like to actually tell a story about things that haven't happened yet but as if they're in the past. And it's this sort of like visioning and also sense of humor that um, wins people over, be them um, you know, other team members or clients or stakeholders. And then I also have listed um, two books if you want more of like an academic kind of point of view. Um, the one on the left is really great for speculative fictions, and the one on the right is the research book I mentioned. That if you're interested in what sort of research methodologies are the best to feed into this sort of process. Um, but we don't have to all like rush out and get like PhDs and speculative fictions. <laughs> um, and because we don't have a lot of time and not everyone needs to do that. And so for today, what I want to do is just um, bring it down a notch actually and bring a bit of interplay between uh, work and play. So. What I've got in the handbook was really like inspired, again, here's my niece and nephew again. Um, I want us to imagine preferred futures in a way that it's child's play and it becomes part of our design process. And use tools and methods that um, bring us back to a time when many of us would argue that we were our most imaginative, our most industrious, our most hopeful and most completely and totally unworried about the days and weeks and, and years ahead of us. So this was my style guide <laughs> for what you have in your hands here. Um, and um, what, we can go ahead and open it. Um, and we're gonna do th at least three, but hopefully four um, utopian design fiction activities. So the first one um, is about identifying preferred futures. So if you can go to pages two and three, what we have is a word search. And um, I'll give you a minute to, you can pick left or right side. But what you're going to want to do is um, 
Think about that preferred future that you would be really proud of being a part of making. And circle the words that describe the preferred futures you want to be a part of making, but strike anything out that you'd rather guard against in your design. Okay? Okay. And I, I know you only got started, but you can bring this home and continue on. I want to go to the next steps. Um, but just really briefly, um, who that worked maybe on the attention one circled things like clear thinking, pure concentration, energized focus? Yeah, yay. And then anyone that working on the social reasoning one maybe circled things like authentic connections, belonging, cooperation? Yeah. And who feels like maybe I'm starting to cram values down your throat? You know, <laughs> like anyone? Yeah. Well, that's kind of. Part of our role uh, as designers, no, like um, this is something that's awkward, but we, it's, this is part of having the window of opportunity to do it. So finding like playful and kind of cheeky ways to do it may be something that works. Okay, um, the second thing we want to do is really start to envision the human impact. So um, from here, let's turn to page five. A well-considered utopian design fiction, again, envisions our work as having a healthy emotional impact on the individual, the household, and the community level. So let's spend a minute here, very briefly. Um, imagine your preferred future or your product has already launched with your preferred future in mind. Like, what are some of the things that um, your future users are going to say in the comments section that um, help you know that um, there are signals to you that you're positively affecting uh, mental health? So you go ahead and write, write in the comments. Okay, again, this is really fast, but you can see how, you know, this was my inspiration for an activity here. What's the cat thinking, you know? What are other activities that we could be doing with our, um, with our teams or uh, clients or stakeholders that really are, you know, the cat is the future user. What are their thoughts going to be? And on the right here, this is um, really one of the best models I've found that really um, address positive mental health and this sort of like nesting doll sort of thing where we have the individual, the household, the community, and so society. This is a nice model to take a look at. Um, when, you know, in our industry, I'm hearing people say like the question, what if everyone does this? This makes it, a, this is more robust and um, gives us a lot to work with. So the third step um, we'll do is out we want to, for utopian design fictions, really begin to outline what the required change is. So if you turn to page seven, I believe, at this point, I want you to imagine um, a near-term future in which you've authored a best-selling book. And this book is um, something that really galvanized uh, the design community to follow your call for change. And you get to, um, at this moment, draw the book cover and give it a catchy title. And um, it should address a change that needs to take place um, in order for your preferred future to take place. Okay, and again, you can see um, other activities that could address, like, what are some of the changes that need to happen in society or technology or culture? Um, could be imagined, like, what new Wellington meetup groups would come together with like-minded people as this change took place? Or, um, you know, similar to this spacewalk, draw your face so you and Funky Monkey can be space fashionistas together. We could imagine ourselves, like, Imagine the 25-year anniversary of this change. You are the like head speaker. Draw your face behind the podium. And what's your PowerPoint presentation slides going to look like? Where each slide is like outlining, these are the key changes that needed to take place. Um, this is how we got here. This, this, is, um, this has been our path. 
So the last activity, and I'll leave this on you to do in your own time, is really to envision your product future. Um, you've got an activity where it's like, hey, you've made it, your app of the day. Um, but what does your actual future product look like on, on launch in a way that really you know, addresses your preferred future, the emotional states that your product and experiences support? and um, are done in a way that are helping you know, build momentum behind these kinds of changes that need to take place. Um, so something like you know, this salon style design your own line of beauty products can be adapted to envision like what's our stand gonna look like at a product uh, show or what's the unboxing experience going to be. And that's really it. These are the four activities, a summary here of at least four steps of things that um, I've at least been able to put together for you in a very quick experience. Um, I have two weeks with students, so um, you can take this with you and, and run with it. Um, but before I wrap up, I just allow me to get like kind of soft and squishy here because I want to bring this back around to my time in New Zealand. Um, because compared to glaciers, which take dozens of thousands of years to carve out space for glorious ecosystems like this that get a chance to thrive for really um, thousands of years more, our time and impact in the world is really small. But as designers, we are critically positioned in a time that is super critical. Um, that we do have this chance to make significant positive impact. And if collectively, if we embrace practices like utopian design fictions and stake a claim in the intentional um, preferred futures that we want to be a part of, um, we can support things like calm and balance and safety and pauses, authentic connections, belonging and cooperation. And the more that we do things like that, the more that beauties like this um, get a chance to stabilize, and the more that we as individuals and households and communities and societies um, get a chance to thrive in this beautiful world we've been born into. So thank you.